in this lesson, we're going to continue talking about the pre-Socratic philosophers. We've spoken about Thales, we've spoken about Anaximandia, we've also spoken about Pythagoras, and in this lesson, we're going to talk about uh, Xenophanes, someone who we know a little bit more about in terms of their philosophy, but still not that much uh, compared to as we carry on and we look at people like Heraclitus, for example, and then we get into actually looking at Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. So... Now that we've looked at some of the earliest Greek pre-Socratic philosophers, we're going to move on and examine a period that is marked with a much wider understanding of the philosophy than the previous era. So we sort of divide the eras up a little bit, and we sort of argue that Xenophanes begins a, a, a new era of, um, of ancient Greek philosophy, but for the most part, uh, most people will just lump all of these uh, people in together as the pre-Socratics. And that's what we're going to do. This period, we have a much greater wealth of primary resources to understand the thinkers' beliefs. So uh, even though there isn't uh, that much on um, Xenophanes that we have in terms of primary sources, we still have a lot more than we do of, for example, people like Thales. And when we carry on and we start to look at people like Heraclitus, uh, uh, like Parmenides, uh, for example, we're going to see that they have a lot more sources and wealth of information about them um, than the people like Thales, for example, which is a um, very sparse amount of information. So let's take an introduction to Xenophanes. Xenophanes of Colophon was born around the year 560 BC and died around the year 478 which is, for ancient Greece, an incredibly long life, <laughs> as you can probably see here. Um, we don't know exactly the years that they, uh, that they were born and died, but um, generally speaking, we know that they, were, they lived a very long life, and they lived around 560 to 478. And it is said that Xenophanes himself was actually expelled from Colophon, when he was young, and he actually spent the rest of his life as a kind of wanderer, producing his own thoughts and developing his own philosophy. Now, he was expelled from Colophon um, for uh, arguably uh, or allegedly um, being involved in a revolutionary action. And we see here that um, the the mysticism around uh, Xenophanes is almost a little bit like the mysticism around Pythagoras that we looked at in the last lesson where they uh, began to uh, live a life as a sort of quote-unquote wanderer, producing um, lots of different philosophies and different um, poetics and different, um, different ideas. And just like with all of the pre-Socratic philosophers we have explored thus far, there is a heavy emphasis with Xenophanes on the idea of cosmology and the nature of the universe. And just like with the pre-Socratic philosophers we looked at as well, um, there was a an emphasis on the idea of fundamental principles of all things. Just like Thales believed that water was the fundamental principle of all things uh, in reality, according to Xenophanes, he developed his own account of cosmology and reality, believing that the fundamental principle of all things was Earth. Now, you might be starting to wonder, those of you who have um, ever uh, watched uh, The Last Day of Bender, probably begin to get an idea of the kind of, um, where the idea of the, uh, of the fundamental elements in that show uh, has come from. Because in that show, we have uh, water, air, earth, and fire, and you will start to develop, and we will start to see as we go through the different philosophers, we go through Thales, we go through uh, Anaximander, uh, we go through Xenophanes, we start to see that, um, <laughs> that water, earth, uh, air, and fire are the fundamental principles um, that these philosophers believe in as well. So quite a nice little link there if anybody is interested in there uh, or at least want to go back to their childhood and look at some old cartoons. Um, that's where these things come from. So Xenophanes himself believed that the earth was actually infinite. And so if you were to dig down and you will never reach the bottom, it was a complete um, infinite um, earth that uh, you know wasn't like any kind of globe that existed uh, and this does raise a bit of a problem okay and we see the um, we see the fragment here where he believes this he says that all things from earth and in earth all things end now you might be looking at this and you might be thinking there's a little bit of a um, 
uh, biblical reference almost in this in this fragment you can almost make the link from this fragment to the idea of um uh, of of the the idea of uh, the biblical idea um, that of ashes to ashes and, and dust to dust and things coming back to the earth and of course um you might find that there are little biblical links um, that are that are that are found with ancient Greek philosophy. Of course, ancient Greek philosophy came uh, much earlier than than both the Old Testament and the New Testament, and so we can see that there might be little small influences as we go along. And you might want to um, make these little references uh, as we see them. Now, it is clear, at least from this passage, that Xenophanes believed the Earth to be a fundamental element just as Thales believed uh, water was the fundamental things of all life and all of nature and so Xenophanes believed that all things from earth and in earth all things end now since Xenophanes believed the earth was infinite and it you could dig down and you would never reach the bottom he did not believe therefore that the sun passed under the earth since there was nothing for the sun to pass under there was just an infinite earth so what did he believe about the existence of the sun how did he believe the sun came up and then eventually set well instead of coming to the belief that the sun was uh, something that passed under the earth uh, and rotated around the earth or uh, as we now know the earth rotated around the sun so often he believed that the sun was not a single entity and that existed in the sky rather he believed that the sun that we see every single day was actually new every single day the sun was made from sparks in the sky and came into existence in the morning and then dispersed off into infinity when the night came around. Now, you might think that this is quite a silly understanding of how uh, the sun uh, operates today. Obviously, you've got you know uh, more than 2,000 years of experience on Xenophanes. But in reality, if you believe that the Earth was infinite and you believe that there was no getting the, the the earth you could just dig down forever and you would never reach the bottom which xenophanes certainly did believe then the idea that we see a new sun every single day is not something that was um, particularly um, outlandish of a thought especially when we have some quite outlandish thoughts um, in ancient philosophy already and so what we see here is actually quite interesting that um, he likens Xenophanes um, the idea of there being multiple suns with the idea of there being multiple days. He believed that just as there are multiple days, as days um, carry on and we have uh, lots of them throughout the years, okay, so too are there multiple suns. Now, this is actually quite interesting because there is a link that, to be made here. There is a link that Xenophanes makes between the sun and the days, but it's just not how we would describe this link in, in modern science today. Now we know that uh, the rotation of the Earth um, is what defines a day in modern science to, uh, today. And uh, Xenophanes makes this link, but he doesn't make the link in the same kind of way. He believes that the sun is actually new and it is the Earth that is infinite. So rather than it being the sun that is a more fundamental, uh, a more fundamental thing um, that exists, it's actually the Earth that's more fundamental, according to Xenophanes. So we can see a little bit of a uh, of a link between um, days and the sun, but in no way would we suggest that this is any kind of um, legitimate scientific discovery. There's also a nice link with religion that we see with Xenophanes. So he is known for being a little bit of a demystifying philosopher. When it, he came to make statements about the explanation of reality in nature, he did not rely on overly theological interpretations. Now, the idea of there being quite a lot of theological interpretations was something that we did see a little bit of with the other philosophers that we will come on to as well. Um, rather than a theological interpretation of rainbows, for instance, um, as some kind of divinity, as was believed by lots of different people and lots of different thinkers and philosophers in ancient Greece, Xenophanes took a more mechanistic interpretation, and he argued that they were simply multicolored clouds. So he takes the theology out of all of these different ideas. Now, this is not to suggest that he was not theological at all. And he simply sought to devoid the theological from the natural. He argued that God did not tell us mortals all when time began. So we see a little bit of a difference here. That the he was not necessarily um, anti-theological or anti-religious. He didn't su suggest that the theological is not to be um, regarded. Rather, he sort of devoided and delineated between the theological and the natural. And he continues um, that uh, God did not tell us 
all when time began. Only through long time search does knowledge come to man. Now, that's a nice little uh, poetic there. And so he, he, he makes it very important to note that there is a difference between um, what is theologically determined and what is nationally determined. Before we finish, I want to just talk a little bit about some of the early scientific discoveries that uh, Xenophanes is credited with. Um, just like with people like Thales and Aximander and Pythagoras, we have some early scientific discoveries that are, are that are linked to their philosophy. So the most interesting is the observation of the fossil record. He believed that the earth was once in a state covered entirely by the sea, which is not necessarily um, uh, false in any particular way. And he uses this basic understanding of fossils to support this argument. He suggested where we see a discovery of seashells found that are inland from um, from uh, from the sea, that this is evidence that the land was once underwater. And so that's where we start to see his uh, understanding of the idea that the earth was entirely covered by sea come from. But in doing so, in, in using the fossil, in using his understanding of fossils and using his discovery of fossils as a, a as a backbone to this um, earthly philosophy, he actually stumbles upon an observation that is much more scientifically prudent, which is a discovery of the fossil record, which is quite interesting um, for Xenophanes to uh, examine. Now, in the next lesson, we're going to talk about Heraclitus. Heraclitus being a much more well, uh, much uh, better understood philosopher than all of the philosophers we've previously looked at.